Okay. Uh, we'll just wait a um, couple of minutes for people to join, but we are live and we will be starting momentarily. Okay, uh, so welcome. Thank you all for joining. We're very excited to be um, able to present to you today a live um, public event in association with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey's annual collaboration meeting. So uh, as a result of uh, having everything online, this presented a unique opportunity for us to reach out to um, the public at large in an international way. Um, we hope this um, timing of our webinar works for most of you, um, as well as the decision to broadcast in English. Um, but thank you, we're really excited. We have 150 people registered from all over the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, today's webinar will focus on the topic of discovering the universe with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So we have a lot of astronomers from uh, the SDSS who have joined today. There are hundreds of us involved in the survey. Um, a small number of us from all around the world will get to um, speak with you today. So I, I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I'm Dr. Britt Lundgren. I'm an astronomer in the SDSS. I'm also an assistant professor of um, physics and astronomy at the University of North Carolina Asheville in the United States. Um, I am currently a co-chair for our Education and Public Outreach Working Group in the SDSS, and I share that title um, with my colleague Rita Tijero, who I'll pass to you next. Thank you, Britt. Um, so I'd like to echo um, Britt's thoughts and words on how exciting this is for us. We've never really reached so many people from such a varied um, uh, sort of varied uh, locations in at uh, one time in the past. So welcome. So my name is Rita. I'm the other co-chair um, of Education Public Outreach for SDSS. Um, I'm an SDSS astronomer. I work at the University of St Andrews in Scotland, uh, where I also uh, teach and, and do other research at the School of Physics and Astronomy. Um, I'm happy today I'll be talking to you in English. I'm Portuguese, so if you have any questions in, in, and you're more comfortable asking them in Portuguese, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, so now we're going to move on and introduce the rest of our panel. Uh, so I'm going to go in order that I see them on my screen. So can I ask Karen to introduce yourself? Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Karen Masters. Um, I am the current spokesperson for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. We go in phases, so right now we actually have two overlapping spokespeople for, the, for two different phases that are sort of ramping down and ramping up. And I'm, in the, I'm the ramping down spokesperson. Um, I am here just in the outskirts of Philadelphia in the United States, uh, where I, I'm a professor at a small liberal arts college called Haverford College. I teach astronomy and physics at that college. Um, and unfortunately, while I speak a little bit of French and Chinese, I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable answering questions in those languages. Um, you can try if you want, but, uh, but uh, definitely happy to answer questions in English. Uh, shall we go to Jordan? Hi, uh, I'm Jordan Raddick. Uh, I'm a scientist and a, an educator at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland in the US. Uh, I've been a part of Sloan for almost 20 years now. Uh, it's been a wonderful project. I'm really excited to be here today, uh, meeting all of you virtually, sharing this with you. 
Um, looking forward to, uh, to your questions and to the presentations today. Uh, Expect Nederlands. Thank you. Next on my screen is uh, Juan. Um, hi, everybody. Um, we'll do video after when we start the tour. Uh, my name is Juan. I've been working for SDSS and UW for about five years. Uh, I oversee plate production for North and South, uh, as well as uh, provide hardware um, support to both observatories as needed. Uh, today, I will be joined by my coworker, Travis. Uh, Travis, do you want to do a quick introduction? Uh, hi, my name is Travis Mandeville. Um, I just recently graduated from the University of Washington in physics and astronomy, um, and I'm uh, employed at the University of Washington as a research aide, and I've been with the survey for about three months now. Uh, yep, so that's us. We'll be doing the tour in a minute. Uh, thank you, Rita. Fantastic, thank you. Sure. Next on my screen is Gina. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you today. My name is Juna Kohlmeyer. I'm an astronomer at the Carnegie Observatories. I've been working in SDSS since I was a graduate student uh, with the early data release, the first uh, data that came from the telescope. Uh, and I am currently the director of SDSS 5. And I'm so excited to be with you all today and that, that you're here uh, discovering discovering the the universe with SDSS, one of the most important things we do as a survey. Uh, I do speak French and German, uh, so if you write those questions in the chat, um, I can I can attempt to respond to to those. Hey, thank you, Tina. I've got Mariana next. Hi, everybody. My name is Mariana Cano Diaz. I am also an SDSS scientist. I am a researcher in the National Autonomous University of Mexico. I work in the Mexico City campus, and I'm really happy to be here uh, joining this effort. Um, of course, you can ask me questions in Spanish if you're comfortable doing that, but I am also very fluent in Italian. So if we have any Italians here, please make sure to type those questions in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mariana. Um, I think last but not least, Tom, do you want to say a few words? Hi everyone, yeah, I'm Tom Peterkin. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Nottingham, right in the middle of England. Um, I've been working with uh, the Sloan survey for, I guess, four years now, um, trying to understand galaxies. So I'm really excited to try and uh, help out, trying to answer any questions that anyone has about galaxies or anything else in space. Fantastic. I think that's everyone. So I think Chris will take you through a few of the logistics of today. Um, and then I'll, 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 I'll give you a little introduction on the survey. Sure. Great. Uh, so uh, today, all of you should have received an email about uh, 12 hours ago with some details and important links that you'll find helpful for today's event. Um, the most important of these is a link to a document that summarizes all, all of the various links that will take you to all of the, um, the websites and the resources that we will be giving you a tour of today. So if you get lost at any point, um, this is your go-to <laughs> web address. Please do check that. Um, that's, that's where you can find all of the other things listed below here. Um, so we are going to uh, start out by introducing you to the survey. Rita will um, uh, give a nice presentation explaining what it is that we do in our large collaboration. Um, and then we'll have a, a tour of a plate lab in Seattle where um, these, these beautiful aluminum plates are made that help us actually make our maps into 3D. Uh, and after that, we're going to invite you to join us in an interactive scavenger hunt, which we're really excited about. And you'll get to um, send questions to all of the expert panelists that just introduced themselves to you. Um, so, uh, so at this point, I will encourage you to check your email and keep this link handy. Um, and uh, I will now pass it over to Rita. Okay, thank you. So I will... I'll share my screen. Just give me a little moment. Okay, so you should now be able to see my 
slides. Okay, so welcome everyone. Okay, so my, my task here today is, is really to give you a, a brief introduction. Sure, Rita, we don't to, see your slides yeah. yet. Oh. Okay. Interesting. As you might imagine, this actually worked when I was testing it. Can you see it now? Yep. All good. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so my task here today is, is to give you a brief introduction to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which I'll often shorten to SDSS. So as the name already gives away, um, SDSS is a survey of the sky. And so in practical terms, uh, what that means is uh, taking different types of measurements of different objects in the sky, and that includes photographs. Photographs are some of the most basic measurements that we can take of the sky. And so I would like us to start with this photograph that is on my introductory slide. And although it's only a very small fraction of all the imaging taken by SDSS, and you will see just how small a fraction that is later, it shows many different types of objects that we can find on the sky. And so I will start, you see these? So these two objects, okay, these two objects here are stars and they are stars in our own galaxy. There are many more stars in this image um, than these two, but these are two of the brightest. And even though they look bright in this image, you wouldn't be able to see them with your own eyes. And this is because SESS uses a telescope to take these photographs, okay? So that means that you can see things that are much smaller and fainter than you could do with your eyes alone. The construction of the telescope as well means that bright stars appear to have these bright crosses around them. This is just an illusion of how the image is obtained. Fainter stars, of which there are many, many on this, on this image, say for example, uh, these here, so probably stars, um, they just show a simple, compact, small dots of various colors. And the color of a star is interesting in its own way, in its, for, for its own reasons, but we're not gonna go into that right now. And one thing that I like to, 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 for you to have clear in, in your mind is that all the stars that you're going to see in SSS imaging are stars inside our own galaxy, the Milky Way. But if you look at other things in the image, you can start to see things that are decidedly not dots and they're sort of extended blobs. Uh, and these objects are galaxies outside our own. Each of these galaxies will have billions of stars in its own right. And SDSS has captured images, I don't know, of over 200 millions of different galaxies. Um, and so one of the things that you're going to see today, and you're going to see this experiences by yourself, is that galaxies come in all sorts of different flavors. Some show these beautiful blue spiral arms and are sort of flattened like disks, and others are more spherical or cigar shaped and are sort of typically yellowish or red. But what I love about galaxies, I'm sort of biased, I study them, uh, is that each is unique, okay? And each galaxy, each and every galaxy is slightly different from all the other millions of galaxies out there. And so that, again, that's something that you'll get to experience today. In this image, we can also see a quasar, at least one quasar. Now, quasars are special for a number of reasons. First of all, they are incredibly bright. Okay. And that means that we can see them to further distances. Some of the furthest objects we can see in the universe are quasars. Uh, quasars are galaxies. Okay. They are galaxies with extremely active or bright centers. And in the image, uh, if you just look at the photograph, they look a little bit like what I told you stars look like. Um, but these things are nothing like stars. So these galaxies with these active uh, centers have supermassive black holes in the middle. And the light that you're seeing here is due to the material infalling onto the black hole. Now, quasars are just incredibly fascinating. Um, I'm not going to tell you very much about them here because I don't have time, but I do encourage you to explore our Voyagers website, which has lots of resources that would allow you to learn about quasars um, by yourself. So that is all I'm going to say. Well, I'll say a little bit more about quasars later, but not, not, not much more. And finally, one of the things that I find absolutely most fascinating about um, SDSS, uh, especially the imaging, is the stuff that we don't know what it is, okay? And so the reason why I chose this particular image to start this introduction is that it allows me to tell you a story that began in 2007, but it's still ongoing today. And it started with a Dutch school teacher Hanny van Arkel, uh, who was participating in a, in a project called Galaxy Zoo. And in Galaxy Zoo, uh, astronomers asked the public to help them qualify and quantify galaxies by looking at their photographs. 
And so Hani was looking at this particular photograph here. This is IC29, uh, 2497, this galaxy here. And she noticed this blue blob uh, right to the side of it. And she, she didn't know what it was, okay? And so she asked fellow uh, citizen scientists and they didn't know what it was. And so they asked the astronomers and the astronomers didn't know what it was. Okay, it turns out what she discovered was an entirely new type of astronomical object, uh, which has been since followed with much more powerful telescopes than SDSS and more have since been found and continue to be found. And so there is a real, uh, potential of discovery in SDSS, okay? Some of, a lot of the imaging has never been looked at by human eyes. So when we ask you to go and explore by yourself, uh, we hope you, you really do have that sense because it's a real sense of, 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 of discovery of what you see. Okay, so hopefully this sort of super brief introduction with this little image uh, gave you a sense of the richness of our data, but how big are our photographs? So how big would this photograph look like on the sky? Okay, so from top to bottom, um, this, this photograph is about 10 arc minutes. If this means something to you, then maybe this talk isn't for you. I'm expecting that most of you, you know, 10 arc minutes means nothing to you. Uh, so I'd like you to think of the full moon. Now the full moon is about 30 arc minutes uh, in diameter from one point to the other. And so that whole image that I just showed you, um, will fit comfortably inside a full moon. Now, but I told you that this was only a very small fraction of the full SCSS imaging. So I'd like you to do something else. I, you know, next time it's clear and there's a full moon, I want you to go outside and look at the full moon and sort of imagine this little patch of sky within the full moon. But I also want you to, if you can, lay down, look up. And if you're in a beautiful place with no, uh, nothing covering your horizon, you have a beautiful horizon around you, no buildings, no, no trees, no hills, say maybe you're at the beach. Um, it, it, what you see, that half sphere that you see above you, okay, is about 20 and a half, uh, 20,500 square degrees on the, in size. So that's, 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 that's a unit of, 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 of area in the sky. Uh, the total SDSS imaging is about 14,000. So that's about two thirds of it. So imagine looking up onto the sky, okay? And two thirds of that has been covered by SDSS if you were to line it all perfectly, uh, more than two thirds actually. And each little patch of the size of full moon has the richness that I've just showed you. So it is, there's a lot of stuff out there and, 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 and we've got photographs of it and you're gonna look at it. So that's cool. Okay, so um, the, the, the star of the show, uh, or at least one of the early stars of the show is this little telescope that could. This is the Sloan telescope. Okay, so it's atop its mountain in New Mexico in the US. Um, this telescope observes the night sky um, every night it can. It, it shuts down a few months, uh, uh, a year during the monsoon season, but it took about eight years from about 2000 to 2008 to map those two thirds of a hemisphere, um, including the image that I just showed you. Um, since 2008, it has continued to take data, but it's not images, okay, and we'll talk about what that is later. Um, and the SCSS has been doing this fantastic, beautiful job of surveying most of the sky that can be seen from a single point on the planet. If you want to map more of the sky, you either move the telescope or you use a different telescope on the opposite side of the planet. And so that's what SCSS has been doing since 2017, uh, using the DuPont telescope in Las Campanas Observatory in Chile that has been taking data that you cannot, simply cannot um, get uh, from the Northern Hemisphere in the US. Uh, our, um, our DuPont telescope is not taking images, but we'll, we'll get to that later. So I told you that SCSS is sort of finished uh, in terms of imaging. Um, the camera now lives uh, in the basement of the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. And this is a picture of it here. Now, most digital cameras, okay, including the ones in your smartphone, if you have one, will have three filters, a red, a blue, and a green filter. And the color photos that your phone takes are just clever combinations of different amounts of each of these colors in each pixel. The camera that was mounted on SDSS telescope it sort of operates in a similar way, but it has five filters, okay? And they were named U, G, R, I, and Z. And one of the neat things about these is that 
three of these filters uh, can measure and record light that your eyes can't see. And so to try to show you that visually, I like to use this image and shows you how much the SSS camera can see with respect to the human eye. So on the bottom axis here, you have wavelength. Um, and the wavelength of light, for now, you can think of it as something that corresponds to how your eye and brain perceive color. Okay, so the longer the wavelength, uh, the redder the color, and equally the shorter the wavelength, the bluer the color. And your eye is sensible, uh, sensitive sorry, to this, to this range here. Now, SSS camera can capture light that is redder than the reddest that your eye can see and bluer than the bluest that your eye can see. Uh, and each filter lets light through in some interval of wavelength, and we call these broad intervals, and you'll see why later. And they get recorded separately. The images that I showed you, the color images that I showed you, combine these filters, some of these filters, to give you an idea of what the sky would look like to the human eye. Okay, so let me recap what I've covered so far. Okay, so SCSS is a survey. We take measurements of the sky. It has taken images of most of the northern sky and the, in these photographs we can see many interesting objects like stars, galaxies and quasars. that are too faint and too small to see with the human eye. And the other thing that's important for you to remember is that SCSS camera uses five filters to capture the color of objects on the sky and you can capture colors that the human eye can't. And all of this, all of this imaging in all of its 14,000 square degrees glory is for you to explore. It's publicly available and Brit will tell you how to explore it later. Okay, but I'm not gonna let you go just yet because there's more to SDSS than just, I mean, just for grass. You can, you can tell an awful lot about the universe from photos. Uh, but if you look at the back of the telescope these days, what you can see is a spectrograph. Now, a spectrograph um, measures light in very small wavelength intervals, unlike the camera that you saw before with those filters. And what that allows us to do is allow us to measure a unique signature for each galaxy, star, or quasar, and we call that a spectrum, and the plural of that spectra. So this is what they look like, okay? So here's wavelength. Uh, again, so redder colors towards this end, bluer colors towards this end. And the height of this curve tells you how much light we measure, and now in very small wavelength intervals. For this particular object, which is, is actually a star. So little troughs and peaks uh, in, 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 in these spectra are called absorption and emission lines, and they're absolutely jam-packed with information about what materials are in these distant objects, and also how, how how they move. Now, so those of you with a little bit of chemistry knowledge, you might recognize some of the annotations next to some of these uh, absorption and emission lines, and they correspond to different chemical elements. So spectra, if nothing else, allow us to know what these astronomical objects are made of. Okay, they allow us to know what is actually inside of them. And now, um, there's two more reasons why we take spectra. Uh, so sometimes, objects can appear very similar in the imaging. Okay, and one example of that is stars and quasars. But the spectra will always reveal their true nature. For example, this is the spectrum of a star, as I just told you. If you look at the photograph of this particular star, it looks like that. It's compact, it's not extended like a galaxy, it's bluish in color, it's a nice young star. Those of you with some physics might be able to know why blue means it's hotter. Um, so that's how it looks like, you would probably see, yes, okay, that's a star. If I showed you this one, um, if I only showed you the image, you might be forgiven for thinking that's another star. But if I look at the spectrum of that object, hopefully, even if you've never looked at spectra before, you can see that qualitatively, they're incredibly different. Instead of these narrow absorption lines, so these troughs coming through where there's less light being emitted uh, at these wavelengths, you've got these emission lines and they're much broadened. Um, I don't have time to go through the physical reasons as why this happens, but again, our site Voyages has resources and activities that will allow you to do that. You can just ask us and we'll answer them. Okay, so spectra are needed to understand the physical nature of the objects, okay, what they actually are, and to understand their chemical composition. Now, crucial for the main science goals of SDSS was also the fact that you can measure how far away a galaxy or a quasar is from Earth using a spectrum. 
Um, and we do that using uh, Redshift. Now, we're not going to go into that. And again, I prompt you to either ask us or explore Voyagers. But you can turn our two-dimensional maps into three-dimensional maps by getting a distance from the spectrum. OK. But we want the spectrum for, you know, we're not going to get a spectrum from everything that's in our image. OK, but we want to get a good chunk of them. We want to get, say, a few million. Um, if you were to do that individually, uh, that will take an awful long time. So the trick and what made SCSS so successful is to find a way to take the light of many stars and galaxies and quasars to the spectrograph at the same time. Okay. And so here we introduce the second star of the show, which is our plate. Okay. So SCSS solution to this problem uh, is nearly 20 years old and is still in use today, although not for very much longer. But it makes use of these large aluminium plates. Now, each plate represents an area of sky that is about three times wider than the full moon. So astronomers decide which, which stars, galaxies and quasars they would like a spectrum for. Okay, they choose that from the images and then engineers drill holes precisely where those objects on the sky are and we know where they are from the images. And there are about 300 and 1000 holes in each plate. And your, your, your main treat for today, I still think, or at least for me, is, is to get a live tour of where these plates are drilled. What happens next to the mountain uh, is that an astronomer will manually plug optical fiber cables onto each hole. And then these plates are mounted in the back of the telescope. And when the telescope points at that part of the sky for which this plate was designed, the light of those objects will light, line up precisely with the position of the fibers, which will carry the light from these objects to your spectrograph all at the same time. And voila, you have spectra for around 300 to 1,000 objects at a time. OK, so this really speeds up how you can map out the sky in three dimensionals um, by making use of these plates. Now, if you're thinking ahead, you're thinking, OK, I told you that we have this massive two thirds of a hemisphere of imaging and each plate only covers about three times the width of the full moon. Uh, so how do we cover the full sky? So the solution is to drill very, very many tens of thousands of plates and tile the sky until you get a spectrum for all the objects that you would like to, to study in more detail. And here's a library of plates waiting for their turn to be observed at the telescope. And so as SSS astronomers up at the mountain will observe between five and 10 plates in a night. We've been observing the night sky for 20 years and the result is this millions of spectra, okay? Okay, so my final recap, okay? So in addition to the imaging, SCSS also measured the spectrum for each of millions of stars, galaxies, and quasars, okay? And remember these spectra, these unique signatures are how much light each object emanates at each wavelength. And spectra can tell us about the nature and composition of the objects, and they can tell us about how far away they are, if we're talking about uh, galaxies and quasars outside of a Milky Way. And SCSS is able to measure spectra of many hundreds of objects at the same time using these beautiful aluminium plates with these high precision drilled holes. Now, I want to, I want to do a plug here for our educational program. Because once a region of the sky has been observed, okay, and we are happy with the data, we're not going to go back to it. And the plates are no longer scientifically useful. And so we have been donating them to schools and museums and artists and other educators. But um, if you're interested in this, please see the Place for Education uh, tab um, on Voyages. And you can contact us if you think this is something that you might like to use uh, in your school. If you're a pupil, if you're a student, take a note of the web page and send it to your teacher. OK, so this concludes my introduction to the survey. Hopefully you now have a good idea of our imaging, the types of objects that we image, how we collect spectra and why we collect spectra. Our next part of this uh, webinar event is your own exclusive live tour, live tour of the Plate Lab. And so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, I'm sure eventually. Here we go. Did that work? Okay. Yes. 
Thank you. Okay, so and I'm going to uh, hand you over to Juan, live from Seattle. Juan and Travis, who will uh, take you on the next stage of this tour. So thank you, everyone, and I'll be happy to answer your questions later. Uh, hi, everybody, again. We had the introduction just a minute earlier. Uh, thank you so much, Rita, for explaining that. That was amazing. Uh, we had prepared something short about how, I mean, why we use the plates. That's very unnecessary at this point. Uh, so let's just get to it. Uh, this is a south plate, uh, the ones that are used at DuPont. Uh, I guess the features that I would show on it are it is printed. On the images that you saw during the introduction, the plates were uh, marked. And you can see a marked plate right here, uh, if Travis can swing this way just a little bit. Uh, but it's basically the same pattern of, of the, the same pattern in the sense that you have six fibers to a group um, and then um, five, five blocks of six to a, to a whole bundle, meaning 30 fibers. So we have uh, 10 of these in the total plate and then they just get plugged one at a time pretty much like so, you just grab the blue one with the blue one, uh, the black one with the black one, uh, and then like so. And so the pluggers have to prepare this every day in advance for the night operation. So it is a tremendous uh, coordinated effort for everybody. They have to get told, uh, I mean, so somebody comes up and says, this is what we're gonna observe tonight, and then they designate the plates, and then those plates get, uh, plugged like so, prepared, and then they're ready for the, for the telescope, and then at night they get um, cycled through, um, depending on the, uh, the night, I mean, depending on the schedule at which they will be observed, which has to do with the astronomical objects that they will be observing. Um, another thing is we have uh, different type of holes, like this would be a guide hole. Um, Travis, if you could zoom in on here. Uh, this one, I don't know if you can see the detail, uh, but you definitely can't. There's a very tiny, small hole on its side, and it has a marking with a number. Uh, that is just a guide hole, uh, meaning that the fiber that goes there, we are not taking spectra of, but those, that image actually goes to the guide camera. And what it uses is, it uses 16 of those uh, to position us accordingly and make sure that all of the other 300 stars stay where we want them. Um, so this is the south plate, like I said. Uh, this would be a north apogee plate. Uh, same, same spectrograph, I mean, same type of uh, science. We have a, a, a twin spectrograph, it would be called. Uh, this one's in the north, that one's in the south. Uh, the plate primarily is split around the middle this way. In this case, they're split around the middle that way. That is just a feature of the telescope and how we made the cartridges. Uh, but you can see the same thing. Now, there's a cool feature about the, the north plates for the, apogee, so for the apogee survey, and that would be the counterboring. Uh, if we can zoom in right here, uh, you can see that one of the holes or some of the holes have a little indentation or like a shoulder. All that that means is that when the, sorry, are we having issues? Oh, oh, okay. I think hopefully you guys can still hear me. Uh, if not, please let us know. Everything uh, sounds good. So the, the feature here allows the fiber to protrude uh, deeper into the, into the plate. So when the plate is being observed, because this is the back side of the plate, uh, this is the side that would be facing the sky. Um, the fiber would just come out a little bit and change the focus of that individual um, object. Uh, here we get to see another uh, apogee plate. Uh, it's just a different field, but it's just an idea of how some fields have all of their targets close up, uh, while others not so much. Uh, and then we have a third apogee plate. Uh, this one is a little different in the sense that it has uh, the manga survey as well, uh, co-observing on it. And we can see some of the some of the fibers for the manga fibers. They're differently marked uh, just because they have specific different fibers that go to it. Uh, I'm not actually sure how long uh, manga and Apogee have been co-observing. Um, then we go to BOSS. Uh, this is another survey on the north. Uh, BOSS is a thousand fibers instead of 300. Uh, this one's not looking at stars, but it's looking at galaxies and quasars. And that'll get just more on the science of it. But you can see the different arrange, different arrangements of the blocks for the different uh, fiber grouping. This one includes 20. 10 are marked to go to one camera, and the other 10 that are unmarked go to the, the other uh, SP1 and SP2. Um, this is just a different uh, boss plate. 
it's harder to tell them apart. Uh, unlike the Apogee ones, there's, there, it's harder to find the features, but there are definitive features. Like, I don't know if you can see this small cluster um, and that'll be it. So those are the types of plates that we can do. Um, now let's just go see how they are made. Follow me. And uh, pardon me if you get a little motion sickness. Uh, we're just walking around, kind of keep it slow. Pardon the tools. Um, so this is a blank plate. This is the way you receive them from the manufacturer. Uh, they are plasma cut into the round shape. And we are given these holes for clearance on the bending ring so that when they get mounted, they can get squeezed through the edges. Uh, but yeah, that is a blank plate. And they go into the, the drilling fixture and onto the mill. Uh, so Travis, let's walk around this way. Uh, this is the mill. Uh, it is the machine responsible for drilling the 12,700 and so plates that we have done so far. Uh, if you want to bring it in a little closer, uh, you can see the fixture that has a mounted on it. Um, it has the eye bolts where it gets picked up by the crane uh, and loaded onto the machine. Once it's loaded and properly secured, uh, this arm will come up and spin out. We'll mount the plate with the sacrificial plate in the back, and then it'll get clamped back down, and then the mill will drill the arrangement that we have asked for it to drill. Uh, basically, the code is loaded, and that determines what type of plate it's actually done. Uh, now let's see what a drill plate looks like. So we'll go over here. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is a completed plate. Um, it is newly drilled. It doesn't have any markings on it as it has not gone to the observatory yet. Um, it does have a tab right here with its serial numbers. And as you can tell, it is very, very filthy with aluminum dust uh, because of all the drilling and, mark and you know, scuffing of the surface. Uh, so then we just take them out to be washed. There are some cool features on some of the plates that you can tell right away without having to mark it or wash it. Uh, I don't know if you can zoom in here, but you can definitely see that that's a very nice grouping. Uh, the only thing I would mention about that is that it is a little harder to do clusters in the south as the fibers have a bigger ferrule, but they still do it quite well. And uh, the robotic positioner for Sloan 5 will not be able to do this kind of thing. Um, okay, so now we have the plate and we bring it over to our wash tank. So here we have a sequence of wash tanks. Uh, it gets heated and it's pretty much a bath of, uh, I guess, wash and rinse tank. It goes in here. And we don't do one at a time, but for right now, that's what we will do. Uh, it is an ultrasonic bath, so you definitely have to hear the ultrasonic as part of it. Um, and there you go. So we submit the plate to 10 minutes of that on the wash, and then another 10 minutes of that on the rinse. Uh, and then once it's all rinsed up, then we just pull it out. And Sorry about that. Lots of loud noises. That does happen. We should be having hearing protection every time working on this area. Uh, this go on the wash, I mean on the, uh, on the drying. And then you just spin it and hit the air. And the plate, I mean, rotate it completely and it gets dry. Uh, once it's fully washed and, sorry, once it's fully washed and rinsed and dried, then we bring it over for measurement. Um, I did choose this different plate just to show you a difference in the south plate. Um, even though before it gets marked, this one's not printed yet, but you can very clearly see the difference, uh, the different two holes. We didn't cover that, but those are acquisition holes for the acquisition cameras in the south. Uh, they don't have acquisition fibers, but they just wanted a bigger field to get to the targets. Uh, so let's walk over to the CMM. And for this time, we'll write you on a cart to minimize all of the bumps and stuff of the road. 
Now we will be walking all around the UW shop, uh, the instrument shop for the physics department. Oh, sorry, let me move this out of the way. Uh, so they don't only do the plate for us, but they also do a lot of different parts. Like they are the ones that build all the ferrules for the north and the south. Uh, they have also uh, been doing the prototypes for the SDSS-5 uh, robot positioner, those ferrules, the snowflake ferrules, so-called. Uh, but they don't only do work for astronomy or physics. They actually work for pretty much all the departments of the University of Washington, as well as uh, pretty much any other research institution that wants to make something. Uh, they are notorious for their accuracy, uh, just a lot of experience, a lot of nice tools. They're one of the few shops in the Pacific Northwest that will have an EDM machine. And uh, they're actually pretty awesome to work with. And the wealth of experience that is accumulated here is amazing. Um, now we are on break, so we'll just do a silent walkthrough. Britt, it looks like we may have lost a little bit of service from Travis and Juan. Okay, well, um, let's see, maybe we can give them one more second. Um, if not, I can jump in and just say a little bit more about what happens with the plates after, um, after they leave the shop. Uh, they may be able to join us again. Hey, Britt, I'll text them uh, really quickly, and if uh, I can help out with that too, if, if you would like. Great. Thanks, Jen. Hello, guys. Can you hear us? Yes. Uh, sorry, we're doing a different audio source. We had issues with connection issue. walking through. Um, oh, there we go. We're yeah. trying to get the audio out of Travis's camera again. Yes, Jason? Nope, everything looks and sounds good. Okay, uh, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, we did have issues with the UW uh, network connection earlier today, and I guess the walk just made it worse. Uh, but let's get right back to where we left off. Uh, this is a plate. It is nicely placed on the CMM machine. There are three points that we want to make sure that we get aligned, and this one, two, and three. There are much smaller holes that get drilled in the CM. I mean, in the mill that we saw earlier, and that is the alignment point for the plate. That is where the mill gets the alignment, where the CMM gets the alignment and where the cartridges align the plates. So basically all three places guide off the same field and that's how we get to ensure the, I guess, alignability of the 300 holes with their respective fibers and their respective targets in the sky. Um, so we make sure it's properly aligned. Uh, that's a slip fit and this is a press fit. So we gently press it into tame. Uh, into place, I'm sorry, and then we get the plate number and make sure that we input it correctly into the machine. And then we have to choose the right plate so that it knows what to measure. And so that's the CMM, and you can see that it's now measuring uh, come on in, Travis. We'll try to see the detail of it. It first measures the height of the plate to make sure that it's not too warped or bent. And then it goes into the selected hole and gets a five position measurement. 
and then runs the code for errors, letting us know that everything is in position. We don't do all the holes on the plate because that would take too long. So we do a subset and if the subset's good, then the plate's good. If we have issues, then we do run the whole plate to find out if it fails or not. Um, we did done about 12,000 and change and very few fail. <laughs> um, and yeah, we just wait for it to finish measurement and then put the next plate. Once they're all measured, um, we ship them to the respective observatory, whether it be APO or LCO. Um, and that's pretty much it for the tour. Hopefully we didn't take too much time and we still have some time for questions and answers. Wonderful, thank you Juan and thank you Travis. Um, we are able to field some questions. If anyone uh, has any, you can submit those through the Q&A feature um, or uh, there hasn't been a lot of activity on the chat. So um, you could also uh, put a question um, to us that way. And we'll keep Juan and Travis on the line in case any, um, any of those questions come in. Okay, so we do have one question. Uh, do the plates overlap each other in any areas? <clears throat> Excuse me. How do you avoid gaps in the surveyed area? Um, so that can go to Juan and Travis or any of our other panelists. So the plates do overlap. We actually have fields that have many plates uh, in the sense that you could choose a different subset of targets from the same field, especially if it's a highly populated field. Um, also, because we want to observe at different times, we could have a revisit of a field. Uh, and if it has changed, like let's say a different time of the year, we could potentially redrill if, if needed. But yeah, they definitely overlap. I, I thought I could add to that. Um, so yes, I, I, I agree with what Juan said. Um, for coverage wise, we um, don't, I mean, coverage of the, of the sky, we try to, um, at least in our survey, which is Apogee 2, uh, minimize that overlap just a, um, a little bit. Um, but as, as Juan was saying, um, what we do do is um, do overlap purposely for calibration. So um, we'd like to look at one star a couple different times uh, throughout the year or throughout several years just to make sure we, we know how our instrument is doing as well as our, our data. And then um, also sometimes what we do, uh, just like Juan mentioned, is um, we try to get uh, different stars, right? Because the plate limits us as to any one uh, stars, uh, number of stars that we could observe at a time. And so we just revisit that same place in the sky, but just with a different site. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Juan. Um, there is another question. How many plates do you send to each telescope? And with uh, what frequency do you send them? Um, so it really depends on the, uh, on the operation at the different telescope. For example, during the summer months, we don't really ship that many plates to APO because they're closed. But usually we ship plates in a batch of 10 to APO as they're needed. And to go to Chile, as it is much harder to do the shipping, we usually do bigger batches of about 50 or sometimes up to 100 plates. And it turns out we ship to uh, APO a little more frequently than we do to LCO, uh, just because APO is a full-time um, operational um, survey um, with both uh, uh, things going on in the bright time as well in the dark time. So APO gets a little more play traffic. <laughs> Uh, there's another question. Uh, how long does it take to drill all the holes in one plate? Oh, uh, so a plate usually takes about an hour on the mill. However, some of the north plates are counterboard, so they have to come back on the mill. But they come back on a different fixture and on their backside facing up because it's not, a, it's not drilled all the way through, but just a counterboard. So that will add about 30 more minutes. Someone else asks, uh, you mentioned that it's harder to map clusters in certain areas. Why would that be? And where is it harder to map? Sorry, I, I didn't mean map. That's my bad. I meant plugging. 
uh, and the reason being is just you have a lot of fibers in the same area and you have to try to keep their their color code up like you know well so it's harder to get into that area the reason why the south would be harder just because the ferals are bigger so you're still trying to compress as many stars as possible in the same area and with a bigger feral well that's just harder if i could just jump in um i got to visit apo apache point observatory um actually in early march so right before um everyone stopped traveling all over the place and um i got to try out plugging um with the um fiber optic technicians there at Apache Point. And it was really impressive how quickly they could do it and how tricky it was to get your fingers in and plug um, the fiber optics into these little holes. It was, you know, it was definitely some challenges when the plate, the, the, the holes were close together and some kind of um, clever thinking on behalf of the, the fiber optic technicians, like the order to do them in. They said that ability in crafting and like if you knit or do like little crafts like that, um, people are generally better at that job. Um, so that was sort of a fun little thing too. Oh, yes. And then, I forgot to mention about that too, is the fibers have a limited range where they can, they can get to on the plate. Uh, so it's important, like you mentioned, that uh, fiber technicians plan out how they're going to do the whole plate. Otherwise, they can get to a point where it's like the last fibers are, don't reach where they need to go. So yeah, it, it takes a lot of experience. I'm actually... I've had enough experience doing it, but not good enough to become proficient at it. I'll definitely take way longer than the fiber technicians at APO. And the observers are also the pluggers at, at LCO. And that's why we print the plates for them. So that, because they don't have time to mark. And the reason, uh, uh, if I just would add really quickly that um, sometimes um, it's a little more crowded than other areas, is if we go after and um, try to target, um, at least for Apogee, um, an open cluster or a globular cluster. So these are collections of anywhere from, you know, millions to billions of stars, right? Um, and if you're just trying to target them, this one small patch of sky, yeah, it, the, the fibers can get uh, pretty crowded. But just like um, Juan and Karen were saying, um, the fiber technicians that we have on staff are amazing. Uh, in the south, I think they average anywhere from about 30 to 45 minutes to plug um, an entire plate, and that's just phenomenal. Uh, same thing in the north, and so yeah, we're, we're really thankful. Great, thank you. Um, there are a number of questions remaining, uh, and in the interest of time to make sure that we can get to the scavenger hunt activity, I think we're going to have to move on. Um, but I, I would invite our panelists to um, respond in writing to those questions that are in the Q&A. Um, at least one of those is in Spanish, so we should be able to cover all those as, um, as we move on. Um, but thank you, Juan and Travis, very much for this exciting tour. Really uh, appreciate thank, it. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It, it is our pleasure to show you what we do. Um, and actually, one of the questions we didn't have time to get to is a perfect lead in to the next part. So someone has asked um, whether all the plates get used and what happens to them when we're done. Um, so I do want to uh, address that very last question. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, we, uh, you know, most of these plates um, uh, are kind of single use. That's not always the case. Um, but uh, but we do retire the plates after we've used them to map the particular part of the sky that they've been designed um, for. And so we have an ongoing program that's led by our education and public outreach team um, that places retired plates in museums and planetariums and classrooms. So if you're an educator and you've called into this webinar, we would um, we would uh, invite you to get in touch with us through our outreach at sdss.org email address. You can request plates from us. We also have a lot of activities for um, hands-on use of the plates in your classrooms that are appropriate for students um, uh, at the, the elementary school through high school level. Um, so please do reach out if you're interested and if you're a student uh, that would like one of these plates in your classroom, um, please do share this information with your teacher. It's also included in uh, the information that we sent you over email um, along with the, the um, information for today's events. So, so please do let us know if you'd like to get one of these unique plates for your own classroom. 
Okay, so, so thanks to uh, the great talks we've heard already, you now are uh, something of an expert on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You know how we've taken um, images of the night sky to cover basically 30% of all of the night sky that can be seen from the Earth. Um, so we have this enormous image of the night sky, which we're going to invite you to explore in a minute. And those plates are uh, the way that we take that image of the night sky and actually make it three dimensional to so figure out how far away different things are, um, what kinds of objects they are and what they're made out of. We get all that information like Rita explained, um, thanks to those, uh, those drilled um, aluminum plates and the spectra we received through them. So I, I think you might be wondering, do we get to name all of the millions of things that we find when we look into these very large images and explore uh, the spectra of thousands and millions of objects? And unfortunately, the answer is no, we don't get to name most of the things that we see. In fact, it would be a really time consuming job if we even tried. So instead, the way that we uniquely characterize every object in our survey that we can, that we can see clearly um, is through its location. So if you think about how we map out locations on the Earth, which is spherical on its surface, uh, approximately, uh, we use a form of coordinates known as latitude and longitude, right? So you've probably seen these before in your classes. Um, the sky, as observed from the surface of the Earth, can also be described as um, a celestial sphere. Um, and for that reason, we use similar coordinates for determining locations of stars and galaxies that we see from Earth on um, the celestial sphere. Now, most of the things we see in the night sky, especially in, in relatively deep images like what we collect with the SDSS, are so far away um, that we can't actually tell that they're moving in the span of a human lifetime. So uh, the location of an object on the sky doesn't seem to change for most of the things that we, um, that we record. And so this is a perfectly good way of naming objects um, in our survey for, for things that are at least relatively far away. Um, so the coordinates that we use, this kind of latitude and longitude on the sky for astronomers, um, we call right ascension and declination. And I'm not going to get into the, the, the gory details of how we set up that coordinate system on the sky, but just think of it as latitude and longitude on, um, on the night sky. So if you've used a nice um, planetarium software like Stellarium, you may have already seen how we make these maps. Um, in right ascension and declination. Here's a, a screenshot from Stellarium where you're looking towards the part of the sky that's located directly above the North Pole. So we call this the North Celestial Pole. And this is where um, the star Polaris is located. For those of you who are in the Northern Hemisphere, you may have seen this in the tail of the Little Dipper. Um, but for those of you who are joining us from the South, this may not be a, a familiar place on the sky. So I just want to show you uh, the constellation Orion, which is visible to uh, observers, at least in part, in both the Northern and the Southern hemispheres of the Earth. So you've probably seen at least part of this constellation before. And you can see here, um, Orion as a constellation, we've given a name, it's very big on the sky. And some of the individual bright stars in Orion, we've also named. Um, but any of those features could also be described by its right ascension and declination, its location on our map of the sky. And you can see the grid lines that tell you how to figure out those coordinates for any of these objects. Um, which shown here are only the brightest. We can see many, many more in our um, image of the sky. And so this is how uh, we're going to invite you to explore the map of the sky that we've made publicly available through the SDSS. Um, you can find it by following this link. If you just go uh, into a browser to skyserver.sdss.org, that will take you to the latest and greatest data release from our survey, which is the, the 16th data release, or DR16. And there are a lot of links here. This website is built for professional astronomers and the public alike. So not all of these things are going to be useful to you. But the one link we'll invite you to explore today is the Navigate tool. So you can click on Navigate to, uh, to explore the part of the sky um, uh, that we see in the SDSS imaging. 
So if you click on that navigate uh, tool, you'll be brought to um, a, a portal that looks something like this. So this is our interactive tool for um, exploring the, the photographs, the images taken with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, so if you look at this uh, portal, what you're seeing is um, by default always the same part of the sky. Uh, I'll show you in a second how you can pick a more random spot so that you're not seeing the same things as everyone else who's joined us today for this event. Um, but uh, what you can see here are, you know, a, a bunch of different things, just like Rita showed you before. Um, if you look deeply, you should see not only stars, but galaxies, and maybe if you're lucky, some quasars, um, or some other interesting features, which I'll show you in a second. We catch lots of asteroids and satellites in our images as well. So you may see some of those as you start scrolling around. You can uh, click on the plus or minus the zoom in and zoom out buttons to um, change your field of view to see more or less to, to zoom in really deep. Um, and if you click on any individual objects that you're looking at, you'll also see a zoomed in uh, view of it over on to the right. Um, you can find uh, you know, if you if you click on an object, you can see how, what it's been automatically identified as. Um, usually that's a star or a galaxy, um, <clears throat> but you might uh, also find that it's identified as a quasar, which are um, uh, the things I work on. They're a little bit more rare and tricky to find, but you might find one today. Um, and uh, you can, if you happen to know the name of a favorite astronomical object, there's a chance we covered it in our survey. It is a really big map of the sky. So you can always try to put the, uh, the name of the object into the search feature, hit enter, and um, you might get lucky. It may turn up uh, in our survey footprint and take you right there. Um, so I mentioned before that we don't actually name most of the objects in our survey. But those coordinates that help us locate individual unique objects can be found in multiple places in this navigate window. So that right ascension and declination, which is a mouthful and we call RA and DEC for short, those are those latitude and longitude coordinates and you can find them in multiple places um, in, in the view through this navigate window. Um, as you're Starting to explore the night sky through um, Sky Server's portal, you are probably going to find really beautiful or interesting things. Um, uh, we would invite you to keep track of those. So we have a, a button here that says add to notes. And if you click on that, that will keep a running list of all of the cool things you find during one of your sessions. Um, it won't automatically save it forever. So when you're done exploring for the day, um, you might want to go to show notes where it'll show you the whole list of all of the interesting things that you've collected during your, um, during your explorations. And you might want to save that somewhere more permanent on your, on your computer. Okay. So now you know just the basics um, that you need uh, to embark on the scavenger hunt that we have planned for the final 30 minutes of our event. We're going to be exploring the imaging, just like I said, and maybe the spectra, if you're, if you're brave, if you decide to be a quasar hunter, for instance, you may need to dig a little deeper than just the images. Um, there are a number of different kinds of objects that we expect you may run into. Uh, Jen mentioned earlier star clusters, right? These are groups of stars that you find in the same approximate location in the universe. Um, they're grouped together physically and you will find these um, if you look around in our, in our survey area. Um, just like stars cluster, galaxies, which are enormous collections of stars, they themselves also can be found in groups and clusters. They're held together by gravity. Um, so you may find clusters of, of galaxies as well. Um, galaxies individually are really interesting things. And uh, just like Rita said before, they're all unique. Uh, there are a few different common types that we um, expect you may find. Um, some galaxies may seem to have not very many features, right? It looks kind of fuzzy. That's just because you can't see the individual stars. There are so many of them. Uh, uh, in this object, but you may see features that are unique in a galaxy. Like in this case, it has a nice bar where you see excess stars 
Um, and there's also likely excess gas in this part of the galaxy uh, that makes it look different from some others that you might come into. Uh, galaxies are come across, I should say. Galaxies can also um, merge. They can run into each other, collide to form bigger galaxies. Um, if you catch them in the act of doing that, uh, what you may see is kind of a, a train wreck of galaxies that are being <clears throat> um, disrupted by one another's gravity as they, uh, as they move past each other or, or begin to merge. So you can find really interesting things on the sky um, uh, when you start looking at different types of interactions. Uh, things that are moving through our imaging as it was being taken with our, our camera, which has five different color filters, uh, actually um, show up as kind of like a stoplight. Uh, you can see in this case, this is an asteroid. It's moving not super fast across the camera uh, as the image is being taken, but it is moving, which means its light can be collected in the different color bands um, when it's uh, actually at different locations on the sky due to its, its motion. So if you see something like this, you're seeing something that was moving at the time the photo was being taken. Um, and uh, depending on how many colors you see and how closely spaced together they are, you can, you can tell something about how fast that object was moving across the sky. Um, we call these weird objects ghosts. Um, in reality, they're not real. Uh, oftentimes, a very bright star can overwhelm the camera and produce uh, an artifact or um, a, a feature where the light kind of spills out to places it shouldn't be on the image. Um, these can often be really spectacular and really beautiful and weird looking. You'll probably come across some of these as you start looking um, through the imaging survey. So keep your, uh, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, in terms of other objects that we expect you to find, um, galaxies come in a couple of um, major types in the modern universe. So uh, elliptical galaxies look kind of fuzzy and um, reddish or yellowish. They have older stars um, and they don't typically have uh, bright blue spiral features like what we see commonly in the type of galaxy that we call spiral galaxies. Now spiral galaxies when they're face towards us, um, they're kind of uh, disky shaped in reality. So, so they're like a Frisbee. And when that Frisbee is fully face on to us, you can often see uh, beautiful bright blue dust um, and, and gas uh, spiral arms where there's often enhancement of star formation, brand new baby stars being formed. Um, but those spiral galaxies are randomly positioned in space and oftentimes they're not uh, facing uh, our, our field of view directly. And so sometimes we see them edge on and then they, they look kind of like a cigar on the sky. And if you look closely, you can see that there's some dark patches. This is really just dust in the, um, the disk of the galaxy that's obscuring or hiding the light from the stars behind it. So this is kind of more or less the view that we see of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which is a disk galaxy, which we live in uh, the, the disk of. So we actually, when we view our own galaxy, we look at it um, in much the similar way as this more distant galaxy in that it's edge on and kind of elongated across the sky. A few other, um, types of objects, objects that I expect you'll probably see are, are stars, right? There are quite a number of stars in our image of the sky. Um, those stars are uh, generally stars within our own galaxy because it's hard to resolve stars uh, in other galaxies in our imaging. Uh, when they're very bright, you might see some spikes. That's a telltale sign of a really bright star. Um, and when they're faint, they might just look kind of fuzzy. And just like Rita showed you earlier on in the intro, um, quasars, which are not stars, but in fact really bright centers of distant galaxies, uh, they look pretty similar, right? Um, and it's because they're so far away that they, they really just look like stars um, when we look at their pictures, right, their images. Um, but again, it's through, through getting spectra with those plates that we're able to differentiate them from stars, and so you might be able to find some of these more rare objects um, by looking at the spectra. Now, you can actually find those spectra over here in the lower right-hand corner of the SkySurfer Navigate. 
function. So um, if you think you have a quasar, um, you can look at it. The telltale feature are going to be these really broad peaks. Instead of having really narrow spikes, those spikes seem to be kind of broad. And the reason for that is, um, uh, is a little bit complicated, but it has to do with gas falling onto a very um, supermassive black hole. So what I'm gonna do now is just leave it to you to start exploring. Um, I will point you to, again, to this link, the tinyurl.com SDSS event 2020, which includes all of the other links to everything else. Um, the, uh, a one page version of all of the object types that we expect you to come across, um, which is not complete, but is diverse can be found here at SDSS Scav Hunt 2020. And um, just because we didn't want everyone starting at the very same spot in the survey, uh, Jordan has compiled this great, very long spreadsheet that you can go to and scroll down and pick a random row, which will give you uh, a link to a random location in our very large map of the sky. Now, uh, as you start exploring, you're probably going to come across things that you don't know how to identify. That's what we're here for. So you can send us a, a chat in the Q&A and we'll um, take a look at what you're seeing. Um, or you can submit your uh, question or your object that's a mystery via this um, small form that we've put together here. So you can give us your name and your email address if you wanna make sure that we answer your question. Um, but you don't have to. The only thing you have to tell us is the coordinate of the interesting object you've found. So please um, make sure that you tell us what it's RA, the right ascension, and the declination are. So those two numbers, just to remind you, um, are things that you can find in multiple places um, as you start navigating around. Um, so I'm at this point, I'm going to um, let you all get started exploring. All of our expert panelists are here to answer your questions. So um, please let us know what you find. And, um, and if we don't get any questions right away, we'll just show you some of our favorite objects and wait for, uh, for you all to chime in. I don't know if any of our panelists have some interesting objects you'd like to talk about, um, but if you do, feel free to grab the screen. I'm gonna stop sharing and you can take over. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show you something I found just on a kind of random um, Just a, a random location in the survey. Um, you don't have to look too far before finding something really beautiful. So here's one of those uh, Great face on spiral 
galaxies that was just a little bit outside of the field of view from where Jordan's um, list of random coordinates dropped me off. I assume someone's seen this before, but it's possible that they haven't. One of the things in the chat is, oops, oh, let's see. We just had this one come up in the chat, um, which looks to me like a star. Well, when I, when I first looked at it, it was a star. When you zoom in, you got all these blurry, funny things. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the other astronomers, but this looks like when the star is so bright that it, we call it saturates, it provides so much light to the, to the camera that it just can't cope with it. So you see it just kind of, it's saturated the blue or the green channel here. And uh, another example posted in the Q&A by Henry asking what to, these coordinates. Um, this is another example of, of the funny things that can happen when we have a really, really bright star and it just sort of messes up all of the imaging. Um, and so in this example, it's, it's very red and you can see we've got one of these um, ghost like things where we've got sort of the edge of two images being stitched together, making a funny looking thing. Okay, I can share someone else um, in the Q&A has, uh, has asked about um, something else interesting. Okay, so this uh, does look kind of fuzzy, right? And, and we've told you that stars tend to look a little sharper when they're bright. Um, but uh, this one does look to me like a very bright star that's gotten saturated. Um, and if any of the other astronomers <laughs> want to add to that or or possibly disagree. Um, I would say that's a bright star that's saturated for sure. <laughs> Those uh, that sort of bright cross you see is a classic uh, we call it a dis diffraction pattern. You'll often see um, special effects people actually add that into a special effects of bright lights right um, and that's just that we haven't added that that is an impact um, from a point source a very bright point source like a star through our optics. If we could, uh, d does it have the magnitude by any chance or? Never mind. So we haven't talked about magnitudes, um, but I can, um, I can explain. Uh, a magnitude system is uh, a complicated and backwards <laughs> antiquated system that astronomers use to um, talk about how bright things are. Weirdly, um, these numbers, which are all different magnitudes, um, are telling you how bright something appears from the Earth. Uh, and a larger number actually means something uh, that's fainter compared to a smaller number. In fact, a, a negative number means something very bright. Um, so uh, yeah, so this I don't I don't think this one looks particularly uh, bright for a star, but it is saturated nonetheless. I think the, the saturation probably meant that the pipeline, which measures the magnitudes, didn't work either. So yeah, yeah. Um, I could show something uh, while we're waiting for questions. Um, a lot of people asked about the overlapping. 
uh, plates and how that's done. Um, and Jen answered for one of the surveys for Apogee that they kind of avoid trying to share. But if you look here, what I'm sharing, um, this is actually, um, I've used the plus and minus bar to zoom right out as far as possible. And then I've checked this SDSS plates um, checkbox here. Um, and so you can see each of these pink circles is a single SDSS plate. And so you can see for some of the surveys, I think particularly the redshift mapping surveys where we're trying to measure spectra of galaxies, distant galaxies to tell how far away they are. Um, there was a lot of overlapping actually. Um, so you can, can have a look at that yourself. Was someone planning to answer about why Polaris is outside of the SDSS footprint live? Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, actually, it turns out that um, it's pretty hard to point at the pole star with certain types of telescopes. Um, so the, the sign telescope, um, the way we rotate it, it rotates like on a flat axis and it goes up and down. We call that an alt as mount. Um, that type of mount really struggles to look right at the pole star. And so um, there's a gap in the SDSS imaging right at the northernmost part of um, the right ascension and declination coordinates. Um, all the telescopes tended to have these sort of tilted mounts. Um, and that was so that you rotated them kind of in the same plane that the Earth rotates. Um, and that made it easier to track the sky before there were computers. Um, but it makes it harder for engineering to build particularly large telescopes with those mounts. So modern telescopes tend to use um, this flat rotation technique, which ironically makes it really, really hard to point at the pole star. Thank you. So someone's asking, um, uh, Matteo is asking, where can I find the coordinates of celestial objects with names? Um, that, is so a, I, uh, that is a really good question. And the short answer is we don't have that in an easy place right now. Um, if, you, if you're using the Navigate tool, there's a field that says name right next to the RA and DEC. And <clears throat> if you type in a name there, then you'll go to that object. The problem is that most names that you might be familiar with are so bright that they will be too bright to be seen with our telescope. Like if you type in Sirius or the Andromeda Galaxy or something like that, you won't be able to see it. Um, but there are many other objects that have names and you can type some of those in there. Uh, we really should have a page that has just a list of names and a list of where to find them in SDSS. It was interesting. Sometimes you'll find links to SDSS, like the link to the place in the Sky Server in SDSS on Wikipedia even. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you just Google the name, you might be able to figure out, particularly you can find out the numbers, those coordinates that you need to put in. But sometimes you can even just find a direct link, depending on if someone has already put that into a Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because anybody can edit Wikipedia, you're welcome to do that yourself. Yeah, there used to be, um, so it is now the case that every single SDSS image has an open license, so it's eligible to put up on Wikipedia. That was a change we made a couple of years ago. Um, and so sometimes you'll find Wikipedia editors who, who are not aware of that change yet, but that is genuinely the licensing rule that we have now. So go ahead and put them on Wikipedia um, as much as you like.
So I think everyone is busy exploring. Um, I should say we, we have five minutes remaining um, with our panel today. So if there are any remaining questions that, that anyone on the call has about the survey um, uh, or what it's like to be part of the SDSS collaboration, um, this, this would be a great opportunity to raise those. Um, we have a, a wide range of uh, experience on the panel. So I just wanted to jump in with a comment about the Andromeda Galaxy. So someone put it in the chat window. Sorry, I've lost your name. Uh, yeah, someone else can help me with the name while I'm screen sharing. Andromeda just looks like a yellow box. Uh, yes, it does, because um, it's very, very nearby and bright galaxy um, for the sort of typical galaxy that we're optimized to look at. Again, if you use the zoom, you can zoom out um, and see um, more of the Andromeda galaxy, but it sort of starts to look a bit like a stripy scarf or something. Um, Andromeda, again, it's very bright, right? You can see this with the naked eye from a dark site in the Northern Hemisphere. It's bright and it's big. The full extent of it is bigger than the full moon. Um, so you can actually start to see these stripes that show off the survey um, uh, procedure for getting the images and the way the calibration was done. It doesn't really work on a big extended object like Andromeda galaxy. Um, a number of people have taken this data and reprocessed it and kind of lined it up to match really beautifully for Andromeda. Um, but in this default imaging look, Andromeda looks a bit weird. Um, um, but you can zoom out and see it all a bit better than, than at the default zoom level. So I was just flat playing around and moving around and discovering things myself. And I found this, this ghosting object, which is nice in itself. And then I thought, oh, where's the star that came from? Oh, it's a big bright star. What's this big fuzzy thing? Oh, it's a spiral galaxy. Spiral galaxies are my absolute favorites because they're so interesting and they're so beautiful as well. So if you find out more spiral galaxies, let me know, I love them. And also this, there's something here as well. I, I didn't know what this was. I don't know if any of the other panelists could help me. I don't know if it's an artifact from the star or is it a more distant edge on galaxy? It's not always possible to tell. Can you put the like uh, photometric objects checkbox on? You see that on the right? Yeah. So it looks like we took spectra of it, those dots. Did we take a spectra of it? There's no Objects spectra coming spe up. Objects with spectra no. is Objects the checkbox. Objects with spectra, yeah. 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 Right. <clears throat> so no. we didn't take a spectra of it. So it, it's not always possible to tell from the imaging. It looks a bit weird to be an external galaxy to me. Yeah. It could be. Wow. Let's see what that is. Oh, look at that. That's good. <laughs> Yeah. It's so amazing to think that that tiny little thing in the image might be a galaxy just like the Milky Way. Mm. I, I don't think that the pipeline was right that that was a galaxy, but maybe I'm. So if you look at the top of the spectra, it said it was a galaxy, but it's yeah. a tiny blob with a really, really low redshift, which. So we have a question in the QA how do we calculate oh. distances from the spectra? Mm -hmm. I don't know if oh, you, excellent question. <laughs> other panelists wants to take that on. I can certainly answer it, but, but other people can too. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can, um, normally uh, we don't actually use spectra, or at least um, I don't, uh, to cal calculate distances uh, to my stores. Uh, normally what we do is uh, look at um, positions. Um, and so um, we look at um, apparent positions in the sky and we, so we, we, we basically, um, you know, focus a camera on a star, right? Uh, determine its position and then follow that star over, uh, you know, successive periods, um, successive epochs, if you wanted to say. And from that, um, we can get a proper motion. Okay. This is also true for other uh, types of objects as well. And just with a little bit of mathematics, we um, unfold that in, um, into a distance. There's also another way um, that we can do this, which is um, using uh, luminosity um, as well. So basically the brightness of the object. And from that and a few mathematical relations, we can um, you know, get uh, a distance. 
It turns out that luminosity is a little bit of a tricky thing to use for distance determinations. Um, you know, there's certain objects that are definitely um, what we would call standard candles, right? Where we say, hey, that luminosity really does track well and really does give you an accurate indication of distance. And then there are others, um, variable stars, for instance, <laughs> uh, but t depending on what types of variables, uh, for instance, Soviets give you really great distances. Uh, they they um, can give you um, uh, a little bit more difficult of a time. Um, Karen or anybody, do you guys want to add to that? Yeah, I think we should add to that, that for galaxies, it's a little bit different. Um, and so for galaxies, uh, it, we routinely use spectra just to go straight to a distance. And that, that relies on a, a few steps, actually. Um, so a long time ago, in the 1920s, it was noticed that if you measure the redshift, if you measure, excuse me, the spectra of galaxies, um, the, the emission lines, these spikes that you see that can be tied to specific elements in the galaxy, um, are all a little bit offset from where we see them when we measure them in laboratory measurements. Um, in fact, they're all very much just a little bit shifted to the red. Um, and people investigated this more and more and realized, in fact, if they use techniques like the one Jen mentioned um, to measure distances to a handful of galaxies, um, various techniques about the distances of the stars in the galaxy, um, you could actually show that the further away a galaxy is, the more its lines in its spectra are redshifted. And so now we actually just use that relationship directly. We go from measuring this redshift, measuring the shift in the spectra um, to, um, to the distance directly. And so I guess I should have shared my screen and showed you a galaxy and showed you this in action. Um, I picked kind of a fun galaxy here. This is a nearby galaxy called Messier 101, uh, the pinwheel galaxy. Um, one of the fun things about this galaxy is actually we took lots of spectra of it. So if we check um, the take spectra box, um, we see the spectra all over this galaxy. Um, that was a little bit of an accident. Um, the pipeline thought that this was lots of different galaxies for a little while um, and ended up taking lots of spectra of it before um, it was noticed that in fact it was just one galaxy. Um, but it's really cool because it means we have spectra all along the arms of this galaxy. So it's one of the reasons it's one of my favorite. If we look at just the central spectra or any of the spectra, if I click on them, the, ah, it's not working. Okay, let's pick a different one, hang on. Okay, this is proving it's a live demo. Okay, here we go, finally. So now we've got spectra. Um, if we click on the spectra, you'll see this Z thing up here. Um, this is the redshift. And so you can see what the redshift that's measured. This is, um, um, a number that codes how far these um, specific emission and absorption lines that are labeled in the spectra have shifted from the laboratory value. I just found, um, just as you were doing that, Karen, I just found right next to that galaxy that I just showed, I just looked at two of the, um, uh, uh, of the objects nearby. So I've got one uh, galaxy spectrum here and another galaxy spectrum there. And you can see that the, the, the hydrogen alpha, H alpha, one of the specific uh, emission lines associated with the element hydrogen. In this galaxy, it's six and a half thousand angstroms wavelength. And then this one has been redshifted by a lot or by a lot more. So it's just above 7,000. You can see that the, the, the spectrum itself is moving in red, in, um, in wavelength. Great. There, there's another question that came in. Someone um, is asking uh, why a particular galaxy that they've found um, looks so bright and red. So I'm going to just share um, this object. Um, so this, as you can see, has those spikes that we um, have been uh, associating with bright stars. But if you look at um, how the pipeline, the automated um, uh, pipeline for our survey has identified this object, you see its type is um, provided as a galaxy. And actually this is a, a problem, you know, you can't have individual humans look at every single output for every object from the pipeline. In this case, it's um, the, the automated 
algorithm, the computer that looks at the images, sees this really bright star and notices that it's extended. It looks very fluffy and fuzzy. And that's typically what galaxies look like in our image. So in this case, it's, it's messed up a bit. Um, this is one of those very bright stars. In fact, if you look right at the center, you can see how it's really overwhelmed. Um, the pixels in the camera and, and those spikes are kind of a giveaway. Um, but uh, it's, it's not uncommon that you will find um, errors in the automated typing of objects in the survey area. So you have to be a little bit on your toes as you're, um, as you're browsing. Um, I, I see that we're um, a little bit over time, which is kind of fantastic. This has been really, really fun. Um, I, I did see someone and this, uh, there's one question in the Q&A, but I've received a couple of emails also asking if we'll be making this uh, uh, event available offline and we are recording it. So we will be able to do that. Um, if you formally registered for the event, we can send you a link um, via email, but we'll also tweet it out, I think. So if you're not already following our, um, our Twitter account, then I would encourage you to look for it. Um, it's at SDSS surveys. Is that right? Did I drop an S or add an S? Karen, you can. It's SDS surveys. There you go. The final okay. S is for surveys. Yeah. Okay, maybe you could just drop that in the chat window. <laughs> all right. Um, well, thank you all. This has been really fun. Um, any of the panelists want to say any closing words? Can I show the comment real quick? Yes. Um, so I was saving this for a moment and I, and I didn't notice we were almost out of time. I really wanted to share this comment. Um, this was actually emailed to us. This was discovered by a Scottish teacher named Tim Hewey and his class um, in the imaging. Um, we did try to take a spectra of the comet. The comet had moved by the time we measured the spectra, so we just got a spectra of blank sky. Um, um, and in fact, if you zoom a little bit in, uh, if we recenter and, oops, and zoom in, you can see that the comet moved even while the imaging was taken. So you get this slight like traffic light like thing that we get when, it, when objects move uh, between when the different filters pass over them when we made the images. Um, but anyway, we thought that was a really nice find of a comet. It, it was a known comment, comet, but we didn't know that it was here in the SDSS imaging. So it was kind of nice to find that. So thank you, Mr. Healy, for sharing that with us. Okay, well, on that note, um, uh, the, the site of a beautiful comet, <laughs> I think we can close. Um, thank you all for joining. Thank you again to our panelists. Um, we hope you'll uh, go back and check out our resources. Um, you can find links to those uh, in the email and um, please let us know if you have any questions. We hope to hear from you soon. <laughs>